right, good afternoon. Uh, a few things at the top, and then happy to take your questions. Yesterday, Secretary Austin spoke with his UK counterpart, Secretary of State for Defense, John Healy, to discuss a range of regional and bilateral issues. The two leaders discussed their close cooperation to address shared challenges, including countering Russian aggression in Ukraine, the ongoing instability in the Middle East, and cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Secretary Austin and Secretary Healy reflected on the strength of the U.S.-U.K. defense relationship and committed to continue working together on their many common priorities. Separately, Secretary Austin also spoke by phone yesterday to Ukrainian Minister of Defense Rustem Umerov regarding priority security assistance efforts and Ukraine's ongoing operations. Secretary Austin and Minister Umerov also discussed the strong support from allies and partners in helping meet Ukraine's urgent military requirements. Minister Umerov provided an update on battlefield dynamics as well as the impact of Russia's continued attacks in Ukraine. And the full readouts of both of these calls can be found on defense.gov. And finally, the department continues to closely monitor the situation in the Middle East. As you've heard us say throughout the week, Secretary Austin and the department have taken actions to reinforce the United States' commitment to defend Israel and to protect our forces by strengthening U.S. military force posture and capabilities throughout the Middle East in light of the escalating regional tensions. We remain focused on de-escalating tensions in the region while also postured for deterrence and the defense of Israel. The U.S. government also remains very focused on securing a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal to bring all hostages home and to end the war in Gaza. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Tara. Hey, Sabrina. Um, so let's start with Ukraine. You just did the readout from the call. Did that call include, now that Ukraine is on an offensive, does that change what sort of weapons they are seeking and would the U.S. support a different request specifically to support this new offensive maneuvers? Thanks, Tara, for the question. So in terms of um, weapons that we're providing Ukraine, um, in, in the immediate, it doesn't impact what we're providing them. Um, but you've seen us change the types of weapons and systems that we've given over the course of time. And certainly since the war began um, back in February and our first security assistance package rolled out, the types of artillery, the types of equipment that they were getting, uh, you've seen that change and evolve over time to where they have sophisticated long range capabilities, um, along with, you know, we're training their pilots on F-16s. So you've seen us modify and give different capabilities over time. And uh, we reserve that right to continue to do that. So has anything changed um, from the U.S. decision on supporting Ukraine? If it continues to push in further, will there be any sort of limitations on what Ukraine can or cannot do with the systems that the U.S. has provided? So won't get into engaging in the hypothetical, but what I can tell you is that um, we're in touch with our Ukrainian counterparts. As I mentioned at the top, the secretary had a call with his counterpart yesterday. Um, we're always assessing what they need on the battlefield to be successful. And we believe the the capabilities that we continue to provide them are, you're seeing those successes come to fruition as they continue to fight along the east and sort of the, the northern south, uh, southern part um, in that eastern area in Ukraine. Um, so we're committed to providing more presidential drawdown packages. I think the, the most recent one was as of last week. Um, we're going to continue to do that. If there is a change in capabilities or anything that we're providing them, we always read that out in our PDA packages. Um, so we'll keep you updated on that. OK, and, uh, oh, just sure. one last one. Um, any indications that Russia is sending in reinforcements to Karsk? So we have seen um, some Russian units be redirected from operations in Ukraine towards the Kursk area. Um, these are just early reports, um, so I can't really say with certainty the numbers or you know their objectives, but we have seen some movement there. Natasha. Thanks, Sabrina. So that was kind of my question. Um, I'll phrase it in kind of a different way, though. So does the DOD have any assessment of how Ukraine's operation in Kursk may have changed the battlefield dynamics inside Ukraine in terms of Russia shifting resources over the last 10 days? Has that impacted their ability to advance, Ukraine's ability to defend, given they've also, you know, devoted a lot of troops to the Kursk operation? So uh, right now, what I would say is it's still too early to tell. Um, and we are, you know, the secretary had a call with Minister Umerov yesterday. Um, 
throughout the department, we are engaging with the Ukrainians, um, trying to get a better understanding of their objectives. Um, so I don't have more for you right now. It's something that we're continuing to engage on, we're going to continue to monitor, um, but I'm just going to have to leave it at that right now. Does the secretary support the operation, given that he spoke to Umarov and now, you know, probably has a better understanding of what they're trying to achieve? Well. What I can tell you is that we're still trying to learn more about it. We're still trying to learn more about what their objectives are. So I'm not going to get further into what they discussed on the call or um, our support. What I can tell you is where we are supportive, and that is Ukraine um, continuing to defend itself. And that's why um, you've seen us provide packages at the rate that we do and at the consistency that we do. Um, and that commitment hasn't changed. And um, the president has been clear that we're going to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. So I think... We'll just leave it at that. Yes, over here. Yeah. Thank you so very much. I have two questions, one on Iran, one on Afghanistan. Let's start with Iran. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran, yesterday said that non-tactical retreat in any field, including the military, leads to God's wrath. How does it, the Pentagon interpret that? Does it suggest Iran is still considering uh, a retaliatory attack on Israel, or it includes that uh, Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, is backing down? Yeah, I'm not going to speculate on comments that the supreme leader makes. Um, what I can tell you is what we're doing in the region is that um, you've seen from some of our announcements that the secretary has made is that we are moving additional capabilities into the region um, so that regional tensions um, can calm and so that we're you know we're bolstering our security presence should we need to defend Israel if Iran were to attack we don't want to see that happen yeah. which is why we've been very clear and you've heard um, you know Secretary Blinken speak to this as well and Secretary Austin um, when they were on their trip in the Indo-Pacific together just a few weeks ago that we've been very clear with Iran directly publicly and privately that we do not want to see this this broaden out into a wider regional war. Yeah. If Iran retaliates against Israel, how does the Pentagon assess the threats from the proxies in the region, in uh, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Yemen? And what strategies are in place to counter these groups if they join forces uh, with Iran in uh, any sort of uh, coordinated attack against Israel? So appreciate the question, but as you know, I'm just not going to engage in a hypothetical on if, what, and when could happen. Um, what I can tell you is what we're doing, and that is exactly what I said earlier, is that we've increased and enhanced our regional presence so that um, to send a message of deterrence, to send a message that we don't want to see this widen out to a regional war. Um, and when it comes to attacks on our forces, you've always seen us take measures we need in order to respond. Um, and if there were to be any attacks on our forces, whether it be in Iraq and in Syria, we always reserve that right to respond at a time and place of our choosing. Uh, but I'll just leave it at that. Dan. So on U Ukraine and the situation in Kursk, could you just maybe clarify a little bit about what's happening on the battlefield and, and how to interpret it? You were indicating that Russian forces have had to be diverted from areas in Ukraine, from Donbass, to help defend Kursk. Is that correct? So what I would tell you on um, the actual battlefield, and as you, you know this, is we usually let the Ukrainians speak to what's happening on the battlefield. Um, so I would let them really speak to their objectives and what they're looking to accomplish in Kursk. We, too, are, are trying to learn more about their obje objectives and goals. Um, in terms of what I said about Russia, again, these are early reports, but we are seeing some movement um, of Russian units being directed towards that region. But in terms of numbers or what their objectives are, I, you know, I don't have that for you right now. Is there an indication, though, that Russian supply lines and communication lines have been damaged or strained because of the operation in Kursk, that they're having trouble supplying their troops in Donbass, for example? So I don't have that assessment right now. So I just, I wouldn't be able to speculate on that. Okay. Sabrina, this spring you sent reinforcements to the Middle East, but that did not deter Iran from carrying out a major attack on Israel on April 13th. Why should this time be any different? Well, Lucas, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I actually think you should take a step back and realize what we did accomplish on April 13th. Uh, yes, Iran did attack Israel in an unprecedented manner, uh, but I'll remind you that on that day, we shot out of the sky 90% of what they threw at Israel. And that was um, an incredibly intricate operation with the Israeli um, uh, 
military, our military, and our partners and allies in the region. Um, so while you can focus on the fact that Iran did launch that attack, I think it's incredibly important to remember what U.S. forces did that day and the fact that we will stand with Israel again and have said that very publicly and privately. So why, getting to your question of, uh, you know, what's to stop Iran doing it again? Um, well, Lucas, we demonstrated our air power on that day um, in quite a professional manner. Um, and again, I'd point to the fact that, you know, over 90 percent of what was shot towards Israel was taken down by either our forces or partner forces or Israeli forces. Um, so I, you know, if I were Iran, I'd be thinking about that. Um, and as you've seen, we've, you know, we've we've removing the aid to the region. Um, we've accelerated her um movement into central command uh and i'll just leave it at that so just to be clear the message to iran right now is <coughs> if you launch another major attack the u.s and its allies will shoot down these missiles and drones that's the message i don't think we've actually uh been delicate in our messaging to iran we've been very clear that if uh if israel is attacked we will come to the defense of israel you saw us do that on april 13th i'm kind of paraphrasing what you're saying there um we will do that again should israel be attacked we absolutely will come to israel's defense does part of that defense of israel also include potential strikes inside iran yeah so i'm just not going to go into any hypotheticals lucas but i appreciate the question Jeannie. Thank you, Sabrina. Two questions, <coughs> excuse me, two questions on Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Former Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu recently visited Iran and promised uh, missile support to Iran. Normally, Iran provides Russia with weapons to be used to in the war in Ukraine. Will the, this affect the world? between Israel and Iran and Hamas? So it's just making sure that I understand your question, Jane, you're asking about a, a visit by uh, Shoigu to Iran yeah. and how that could impact, yeah, could impact uh, the Middle, Middle East? East? Yes. So I can't speculate on, you know, on that visit. I, I would say that I think um, separately, We've seen a deepening cooperation and relationship between Russia and Iran as Russia continues to um, engage in its unlawful war in Ukraine. So, you know, we've we've seen that deepening partnership. We've seen Russia continue to seek weapons out from Iran. Um, while I can't speculate on what this visit entails, um, you know, we've seen these visits of leaders um, happen over the course of the last two years. Um, in terms of how this plays, you know, into the Middle East, um, Look, Iran has a choice. Um, I think we've been very clear on our messaging when it comes to the defense of Israel. Um, we are going to stand in the defense of Israel just as we did, um, you know, on April 13th. Um, but I'm just not going to speculate out on, on to anything else. But the North Korea is providing weapons to Hamas. And do you think Israel will be uh, threatened uh, if the arms trade between Iran and North Korea continues? Well, look, I think um, Hamas certainly has a network of being able to be financed by Iran. I mean, these are, you know, are Iran proxy groups engaging in um, acts that we saw happen on October 7th. Um, Israel has a right to continue to go after Hamas, and that's what they're doing in Gaza. Um, I, I don't have, I haven't seen some of these reports that you've uh, referenced, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Lalit, nice to see you Thank back you. in the briefing room. Um, I want to ask you one question about Bangladesh. Has the Pentagon ever sought access to the one Bangladeshi island called San Martin Island in Bay of Bengal to have some military footprint over there? You know, I have to refer you to um, Indo PACOM and, and Central Command more on that. I just don't have more for you on that. And secondly, uh, during this visit of India's Defense Minister Rajnath Singh next week, uh, what were the main topics or issues which the Defense Secretary Austin was to raise with the Indians? Yeah, so um, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, of course, we're looking forward to a visit, but I, I just don't have more for you right now. I'm not going to get ahead of the secretary or any meetings that he's doing. Um, as always, we will have a readout of his meeting, um, but I just don't have more to provide on the front end, but we will on the back end as we always do. And the next six months of this administration, what are the, what are the things that secretary wants to accomplish on the India-US defense front? 
Um, you know, the, the, I, I think there's many things that the secretary has laid out um, at the beginning of his tenure um, that include always, you know, following the NDS. That is our North Star. So um, our relationships with the, the Indo-Pacific, meeting our pacing challenge um, with the PRC, that, of course, um, is in cooperation with our partner, India. Um, and you know, the secretary is coming off of his 11th visit to the Indo-Pacific. Um, we've hosted, you know, his Indian counterpart here at the State Department, at the White House as well. So the relationship with India remains one of great importance. It's one of great importance to the Indo-Pacific as well. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, there, there's a visit coming up. And when we have more to share on that, we certainly will. Thank you. Yeah. Me? Yeah, let's stop. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I have a couple on Ukraine. So sure. Ukraine is asking for permission to use Western weapons for longer range strikes inside Russia to build momentum during its Kursk operation. Is this something that the United States is considering? Um, so I don't have anything more to provide on, on long range deep strike capabilities. We have given them um, you know, capabilities and, and, and sort of worked with the Ukrainians on setting those parameters, but those haven't changed. Why is this still considered to be escalatory, given that there has been no major response from the Russians uh, to the incursion of Ukrainians into their territory? I mean, it seems like that every red line that Russia draws Ukrainian military is erasing now. We can have a very long conversation about this. Um, I will tell you that the weapons that we are providing them, and not just, you have to remember, this is not just the United States. Um, this is a coalition of countries coming together through the UDCG, providing weapons and capabilities and support to Ukraine. Um, we believe the best way that they can be effective on the battlefield is by knitting those capabilities together and continuing to push forces back to regain their sovereign territory. That doesn't necessarily happen by doing long range deep strikes uh, within Russia. And of course, we're worried about escalation. Um, so just because Russia hasn't responded to something uh, doesn't mean that they can't or won't in the future. And that's something that the administration is always weighing. Um, but you have to remember that what Ukraine has been able to do with some of the uh, uh, whether it's from us or other countries, they've been very successful in being able to take back their sovereign territory, and they still continue to do it. This is not something that's going to end in a day, although it could if you know Putin decided to withdraw his troops from Russia. Um, but certainly Ukraine, it's going to take time. It's taking training. And what I will tell you is what you know, is that our commitment is with Ukraine for the long haul. We'll just leave it at that. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. A couple of week, weeks back, uh, White House Middle East advisor led delegation visited Saudi Arabia along with Pentagon and State Department officials held talks there. And uh, just last week, we have seen that US lifted ban on Saudi Arabia from uh, offensive air to ground mutations. So question is, is this is part of ongoing Saudi Arabia, US and Israel trilateral deal in the context of Saudi Arabia and Israel normalization? Yeah, so I, you know, we put out a statement on that from the State Department or um, from the White House. I would refer you them to, to to speak more to that. That has to do with FMS sales. So I just would refer you to them. And secondly, Saudi Crown Prince uh, just suggests uh, some Congress people that he is at the risk of being assassinated because of normalization talks with Israel. So he's armed forces chief in Saudi Arabia. He's the man like who is directly engaged with United States and like uh, maybe indirect channels with the Israel as well. So how concerning it is for the United States? I, I don't, ha I haven't seen those reports, so I just can't offer a comment on that at this time. Thank you. Yeah, over here. Yeah, thank you, Sabrina. Yesterday, uh, State Department's deputy spokesperson told me at no point uh, the U.S. government did discuss the U.S. military withdrawal in Iraq. And soon after this comments, the Iraqi foreign ministry issued a statement and they said, there are no U.S. forces in Iraq except for military advisor under, under the umbrella of the international coalition. And these advisors are, there, there's discussion to terminate these advisors in Iraq. Could you tell me, do you have any U.S. forces, troops in Iraq? So, as you know, we have, we have forces in Iraq um, and we have forces in Syria and those forces are there to, um, or they're committed there to 
ensure the defeat of ISIS. And we work with the Iraqi security forces to do that. You know that. You've asked me about it before. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure where the disconnect is here. If you're asking about the higher military commission, those talks continue and are, and are ongoing. Um, and, you know, they are... They are continuing, and and um, you've seen us do readouts of every time those talks happen here, or whether it's in Iraq. But I don't have an update on where those stand right now. And the, the things that the Iraqi government says that there is no U.S. forces <coughs> there advise. What's the difference between the U.S. troops forces in Iraq and the advisors? So I haven't seen those comments, so I'm not going to directly comment on that. But as you know, because we've talked about this before, we do have forces in Iraq that actually have been attacked before, which you've also asked me about, um, and so. Their mission there is to ensure the defeat of ISIS. And we work with the Iraqi security forces to do just that. So while you're referencing someone's comments, I, I just haven't seen them. So I just don't have more to share on that. Charlie. Thank you, Thank you Sabrina. Uh, with the Abe Lincoln headed yeah. to the vicinity at haste, this has been repeated, um, it still won't be there for a number of days. So it'll be irrelevant to if Iran or Hezbollah were to strike. Is the plan, the strategy to have two uh, carrier strike groups in the vicinity at the same time and maybe have an overlap of the Roosevelt? So I'm not going to speak to timelines or how long one carrier will remain in the region and, and, and the other will depart right now. Um, <clears throat> what I can tell you is you know, the the secretary directed the Lincoln um, to accelerate towards the central command area of responsibility. And while I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals, um, we believe that we are postured in a way that should we need to come to the defense of Israel, even if the Lincoln is not there, we would be able to do so with the carrier that we have there, which is the TR and other destroyers that we've moved closer to Israel should we need to come to their defense. But it still doesn't answer the question why. Why speed up? Why? What's the rush? Look, I, I mean, as you know, that the TR, when we initially, when the TR was initially moved into the central command area of responsibility, she was eventually going to leave. We were going to have another carrier come in and backfill. Um, we accelerated the Abe's um, movement to the region because we know tensions are high right now and we want to see them de-escalate. Um, these are all defensive moves. Um, they do send a message of de-escalation. They send a message of power as well that we will come to the defense of Israel should we need to. Um, and that's why you've seen, it's not just the carrier. You've seen us move also a squadron of F-22s there as well. You've seen us move destroyers closer to Israel. Um, this is all done to send a message of deterrence. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Give us an update on the USS Georgia. Uh, my The latest update that I have is that she's not in the Central Command area of responsibility right now. Not yet. Yes. Thank you, Madam. Two questions, please. One, uh, unrest in Bangladesh still continues as far as U.S. military is concerned. Have they ever, uh, if Bangladeshi uh, military have ever asked any help from the U.S. military in those arrests or before or now? Uh, not to my knowledge. We have not received a uh, request for assistance, but also that I can't speak for State Department, so I'd refer you to the state to, to speak more to that. And second, Madam, uh, today is India's 77th Independent Day, and yesterday India shown to the world military might on the streets of Delhi, and including Defense Minister Mr. Rajnath Singh, that, like Lalit Shah is coming this week in Washington, was also there. My question is, as far as U.S.-India military-to-military relations are concerned, this will be his first visit in Washington at the Pentagon after a long, long time, and now third term of Prime Minister Modi. And this will be visit first time after <coughs> Prime Minister Modi visited Moscow, military-to-military relations between India and uh, Russia. So how the military-to-military relations now will be India and U.S. and now before now India and Russia? We still have great military relationships between our two countries. Um, the secretary, you know, visited India on one of his trips to the Indo-Pacific, um, as I told Lalith earlier. But, you know, India is an important partner when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. And much of the NDS that continues to guide this department is focused on the Indo-Pacific and our pacing challenge of China. And India has shown to be a great partner in that. So our mill to mill relationship is strong. Um, you know, ahead of a visit, I, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get ahead of that. We will always have a readout, um, but I'm not going to get ahead of the secretary. 
Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Any more? No, go ahead. I want to ask Charlie's question a little bit differently. And go I was ahead and definitely out. pointing to this gentleman over here in the blue blazer. Noah, we'll come back to you. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, Noah, I'll come back to you. <laughs> Sorry, I just mistook. Yeah. Also on deterrence uh -huh. forces, so same topic. Um, has the force posture changed for those forces that have been moved in the region in light of the ceasefire negotiations ongoing? And just broader, does the administration see Do the Doha negotiation as an opportunity to avoid a broader conflict in the region? I think certainly the the negotiations to reach a ceasefire deal would de-escalate tensions and would avoid or you know, has the potential to avoid a larger regional conflict. Um, but it's also really important to remember that um, it's not just that. It's about getting our hostages home. There's still Americans um, that are hostages. It's also about ensuring that aid can get into the the people, the Palestinian people who, who desperately need it in Gaza. Um, so there's a lot of components to the ceasefire um, talk and, and, you know, the framework that um, – you know, has been put together, but that that's something that you know. For more details on that, I would I would refer to the State Department to speak to that and the NSC as well. But has the force posture changed for those deterrence forces in light of those negotiations? You mean on? like heightened? Uh, we we don't typically talk about that, so I'd refer you to CENTCOM for any further details. Noah, glad I'm not wearing a blue blazer today. <laughs> um, do you have any updates on any new U.S. assets that have reached the CENTCOM AOR in recent days? Um, just to broaden Charlie's question out a bit. I think we, uh, I think CENTCOM put out a statement when um, the F-22s had, had come in, um, but beyond that, not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then to follow up on the, the Ukraine's objectives, note that you said we're still looking for a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a reason that um, Minister Umarov wasn't able to offer further clarity on that? I'm just wondering why there needs to be more exploration after the call. Yeah, thanks for the question, Noah. Look, I'm just not going to get into more specifics or details of the call. Um, we have asked, you know, for 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 more from the Ukrainians. I'm just going to leave it at that. Jared. Hi, Sabrina. Um, Iranian press is reporting, uh, state-run press is reporting that an IRGC official has died. He had been deployed to Syria, and uh, you know his injuries had resulted from a strike, I believe, between July and August. Um, not a lot of clarity there, but the Iranian press is saying that it was done by coalition forces who are illegally in Syria. Did the United States conduct a strike? Uh, uh, the department believe they may have killed an Iranian uh, IRGC official? Uh, Jared, I, you know, I haven't seen these reports from Iranian state-owned media, so I can't confirm them. Um, I'd refer you to CENTCOM for any details on any strikes. Yes. Thank you very much, Sabrina. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. James Bond Stockton was a USPAW uh, in Vietnam for a long time, and he was honored Medal of Honor as well. <clears throat> he was my teacher at age 15, and then since 25 years, I've been a journalist from Afghanistan, Pakistan, that border region. I'm the only English newspaper there. Can you explain to your State Department colleague that journalists who have worked in these terrorist zone areas and who were the first media providers to the U.S. bases over there, they at least treat them with respect, both Vedant and uh, Matt. Since last one year, because of uh, some policy difference, they treat me with so much respect. And this podium, you guys have treated me with so much respect. So is it possible that you at least tell uh, them that journalists who are from the war zone areas, they act, their attitude, their everything is a little different than these diplomatic trained uh, journalists, you know what I mean? Uh, so, look, I, they're my dear colleagues at the State Department. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to here, um, but yeah, go ahead. Please, please, you were going to say something. I, I, I can tell you that, um, you know, this administration, I think, certainly values journalists uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, we value your coverage. We value the questions that you ask us here at the at the briefing room, whether it's in this briefing room or other briefing rooms across the administration. Um, and uh, I don't know if you have a question, but uh, happy to take it. Um, yesterday, the Taliban were celebrating their three years uh, anniversary of their takeover in Afghanistan. And they were flying U.S. made helicopters. They were driving U.S. Uh, car, uh, vehicles, the military vehicles. Um, I had emailed this office, uh, Pentagon, uh, right before the U.S. withdrawal as well that what's going to happen. So at this, can the U.S. now at least disable these helicopters, these big things, or no, they have not thought about it? So this isn't like 
the military hardware. Okay. We were displaying yesterday at the Bagram Air Base. Okay. So, uh, look, I don't have uh, a comment on the types of parades that, you know, the Taliban is doing right now. But, you know, as a, the department, as we come up um, on, you know, closer to an anniversary, I would say that we are certainly grateful for all those that have served, um, for their bravery, for their selflessness, um, from their for their compassion every single day that they showed while they were in Afghanistan. Um, and we we certainly honor those that came back and those that made the ultimate sacrifice, but I just don't have a comment to offer on on the Taliban. Thank you. Just last question. Uh, several senior Pakistani military officials have been, uh, has been arrested in the last couple of days, including a uh, spy master, the general, <coughs> and they were arrested on corruption charges. Uh, senior politicians, Javed Hashmi and Georgetown graduates, again a senior politician, Mashayad Hussain, they all complain from the U.S. that the U.S. only contacts the Pakistani military more directly instead of the people-to-people -people relationship, instead of the diplomatic. Do you guys ever feel that, uh, have anybody ever told you that the people of Pakistan, who many of them uh, support democracy as well, but when their senior politicians say that the U.S military keeps more focus on the Pakistani military than the diplomatic relation. Is that anything of concern to you or not? So I think two separate questions here. Um, in terms of the re the reports that you're cited, uh, you know, where are those reports uh, regarding the arrests? I just don't have anything for you on that. That's, that's really a Pakistani internal manner uh, for them to speak to. Um, as you know, the U.S. values our partnership with Pakistan and engage with both military and civilian leaders based on mutual interests. Um, and we commit, we remain committed to working with Pakistan um, to support regional stability and our mutual goals. And I'll just have to leave it at that. Thank you Constantine. So Thanks. Um, just a quick update on JLOTS, if you don't mind. Has the remaining aid that was in Cyprus been finally delivered, and ha uh, are there any JLOTS components or personnel still in the region? Hang on. I have an update. Give me a sec. Okay. Okay. It's not working. So we're just going to wing it. No, just kidding. Um, uh, okay. So in terms of JLOTS, there, there, um, is approximately, I got it, hold on. There's approximately six million pounds of aid left on the Cape Trinity. Um, that has not been fully distributed into um, Gaza yet. We're still um, we're still working that through. In terms of redeployment, um, uh, and this is what I wanted to make sure that I had for you, 235 soldiers returned to Joint Base uh, Langley Eustace earlier this month, 209 sailors returned to Naval Air Station North Island last week, um, and a, an additional approximately 100 will be returning in the coming days. We expect all personnel and equipment to be coming home by mid-September. As soon as that aid is, is distributed, and as you know, we are committed to making sure that that aid does get distributed into the people of Gaza, um, but that is still ongoing. Thank you. Okay, yes, in the back. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, two questions. Um, first one, um, do you have any new information about uh, the possible of Iranian attack? I mean, if they move some of their uh, uh, assets uh, to prepare for that uh, attack? Because we, we heard that last days that we don't have anything about that. So. Do you have anything, any new information about that? Yeah, yeah. It, I don't have anything to provide. It's, we certainly wouldn't get into intel assessments. Um, we remain postured, uh, of course, to protect our forces and to come to the self-defense of Israel. Um, but I just don't have anything to share on any type of attack. And as I read out in the top, you know, it's something that I know there's keen interest in. Um, we're going to continue to monitor what's going on in the region, but I just don't have more to share or a crystal ball to predict the who, what, when, where, and, and, and how um, right now. And, uh, my second question, um, do you still haven't seen any signs that Hezbollah wants to start a new war? And do you expect that they would observe a six-week ceasefire, uh, let's say, if the deal will done in Doha and the Houthis too? Well, look, I think a ceasefire deal is good for everyone. Um, that's something that the president has been pushing, and, and you saw him outline that earlier this year, some of the framework com component pieces. Um, those talks are ongoing. It's an important step to securing the release of hostages, um, some of which are American citizens. We want to see them come home. Um, we do think a ceasefire would certainly de-escalate tensions in the region, and that's ultimately what we want to see. Mike, did you have a question? 
do. Sure. The uh, Ukraine's op cross-border operation into the Kursk region was the most significant uh, mission really since the uh, start of the war. This was apparently done without the knowledge of their largest patron, the United States. Now, why shouldn't that be considered an intelligence failure uh, in the part of this administration, this building, and the rest of the IC? Well, Mike, I'd push back on that a bit. Uh, you know, I think some of the things that the Ukrainians demonstrated earlier on in the war is the ability to hold Kyiv, and then subsequently Kharkiv, Kherson, uh, they were able to hold major, major cities that I think back then you were here in this briefing room as well and uh, speculating on what the Ukrainians would and wouldn't be able to hold. Um, in terms of, is this an intelligence failure? No. Uh, that, that the United States did not know that, that this happened until we were not. The fact. Yep, we were not made aware of, of this um, operation. That doesn't mean that it's an intelligence failure. What I would tell you is that we are working with the Ukrainians uh, to, to, to better understand their objectives. And um, I'm not going to go beyond what we had in that readout. They didn't let anyone in the administration know. Does that indicate that there's a lack of trust between Kiev and Washington? No, I don't think so, Mike. I would, I would actually push back on that. Um, we, we have a very good relationship with our Ukrainian counterparts. The secretary on an almost weekly basis is speaking to the U his Ukrainian counterpart. And it's not just the secretary, it's the secretary of state. It's um, you know other administration officials ac ac uh, across this administration, including the president. Um, there is deep trust there and there has to be deep trust. We're on our 61st, 62nd presidential drawdown package. We are pouring millions upon billions of dollars into Ukraine to make sure that they have what they need on the battlefield. We are assisting them with their capabilities. We're training their pilots. We're training their um, infantry to, to be better, to improve their skills. There's absolutely trust there. Um, as we said, we didn't know about this one operation. That doesn't mean that we're not engaged on other things. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Oh, boy. Dan, and I'll take two more, and then that's it. To the Middle East, is there uh, are there indications of an increased threat from the Iranian-backed uh, militias in Iraq and Syria in recent days? Um, is there is there any kind of change in the posture of the, those adversaries? And then also, given the the threat that's kind of continuous to those U.S. forces in Syria and Iraq that you were talking about earlier, what is the rationale for keeping U.S. troops in Syria, for example, if ISIS is is severely degraded and, and mostly defeated. Um, so on your first question, so I'm not going to speak to any force posture changes. I'm not aware of any heightened levels um, in the recent days, but you know I'd refer you to CENTCOM. Um, in terms of the rationale of keeping forces within Syria and Iraq, we are there to ensure the defeat of ISIS. That by no means that ISIS has completely evaporated. They still remain a threat. You might remember from this podium just a few weeks ago, I was asked about a concert that was canceled because of, of an ISIS threat. Um, so ISIS remains a very real threat um, in the region and around the world. Were they the threat that they were, um, you know, 2014, 2016, um, when our forces were at, you know, at the height of engaging them and, you know, they were outside of Baghdad. No, that threat has evolved and they have, um, you know, changed their tactics and methods and, and you know, uh, become degraded because of our, because of the global coalition that we've built. Um, but ISIS still remains a threat and I don't think we're turning a blind eye to that in any way. Okay, two more. One and then Charlie gets the last one. Uh, colleague's question about ISIS. So, uh, President Biden, uh, repeatedly said that over the horizon is an effective program to monitor or to control what's going on in the region like Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, how, uh, what is the Pentagon's assessment on that? Is that effective? Uh, how does it work? And also, does the United States still control Afghanistan's airspace? Because the Taliban's uh, defense ministry said a couple of days that, a couple of days ago that uh, we, the Taliban, don't have any control uh, on our airspace in Afghanistan. And they claim that some drones are flying over different cities of Afghanistan, like Kandahar, Jalalabad, and some other areas. Who, who, who controls that? The, the, the Pentagon? Well, that seems like a them problem, not an us problem. Um, in terms of uh, 
uh, are over the horizon capabilities effective? Uh, yes, they are. Charlie. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. I'm just curious, going back to Ukraine and Russia, I know the United States has cautioned Ukrainians of using certain weapons that might penetrate deep inside Russia. Now that the line of scrimmage has moved forward, are there restrictions on what kind of weapons can be used on Russian soil? Thanks, Charlie, for the question. Um, nothing has changed in terms of our policy. So the policy that we set out from the beginning and allowing those counterfire measures to, to um, take place around that Sumi area, nothing's changed on that. Nothing has changed on our long range um, you know, fires uh, policy as well. Um, we still believe that with the coalition that we've built through the UDCG, that we are providing the Ukrainians what they need on the battlefield to be successful in that Northeast area region and in the South. Um, and we believe that they have the capabilities to be successful with what we've given them. But, 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 the, US, okay. but the US policy was never, never considering that weapons like these might be used inside Russia. So, so Charlie, what I would what I would tell you on that is once again on the Kursk uh, incursion, we're still we're still working to get more uh, from the Ukrainians on their objectives. So I don't have more to share on that. In terms of like what you were saying on like we've never seen this, you have to remember that. And to Tara's question at the beginning, at the beginning of the war, what we were providing. Or like javelins and stingers. What we're providing them today looks very, very different from that PDAs one through 20 possibly. So you have to remember that every time that the battlefield has changed and adapted, whether it be terrain or capabilities, we have adapted as well. So we're not ruling anything out right now, but if the battle change, if the ba as the battlefield dynamics change, we always reserve the right to work with the Ukrainians on what they need. And right now, you're seeing them. You know, they have these F-16s that are there. They've they've showcased that. Um, that was a capability that was not something that they needed at the very beginning of the war. But now we that now they need that. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. I will take one more question and then we're wrapping. Sabrina, in the past three yeah. years, U.S. forces have pulled out of Afghanistan, the Taliban's taken over, Putin launched a major uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, Iran carried out a major attack on Israel, there was the October 7th massacre, uh, U.S. Navy has been engaged uh, for months in a war again in Yemen against the Houthis. Uh, U.S. forces have pulled out of bases in Africa. Has the Pentagon lost the ability to deter? No, I would actually say quite the opposite. You know, as, as I mean, you mentioned many, many uh, examples there, but what I would tell you is the United States is not in a long protracted war. Uh, what you're seeing the United States do, whether it be in the Red Sea and the BAM, we're protecting commercial shipping. What you're seeing us do in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Central Area of, uh, Central Command Area of Responsibility is we're protecting our forces and we're coming to the self-defense of Israel. So... <laughs> Happy, happy to have a longer conversation about this, but our goal right there, I think, I think you have to separate defeat versus what our intentions are. And our intentions are to allow commercial shipping, to allow, to allow. Let me just, let me just take this one, Lucas, and finish this up. Um, we have, we have to continue to allow commercial shipping through that Red Sea Passage.